Let's face it, EPS is going away. It's a dying file format quickly being replaced by PDF. But there are a few times that you might still want to get an EPS file out of InDesign. For example, if you've designed an ad in InDesign, but you think the ad will be imported into Quark Express 4. I have newspaper clients who still use Express 4, and they do a lot of this. Now, I do not trust PDF files in Express 4 or Express 5. Maybe Express 6, but not 4 or 5. So, in those situations, I suggest using EPS. To get an EPS out of InDesign, you go to the File menu and choose Export. Then, from the Format pop-up menu, choose EPS. When I click Save, I get the Export EPS dialog box, which is relatively simple once you understand what's going on. First, which pages do you want? If you choose more than one page, you'll get multiple EPS files. Next, what level of PostScript do you want? If you're sending EPS files, you probably just want level 2. Do you want CMYK color or something else? And again, in general, if you're sending an EPS file, perhaps to a Quark Express user, you want CMYK. What kind of preview do you want? EPS files have previews built into them most of the time. TIFF is the most standard will work both on Mac and Windows, so that's usually what I go for, even though it's not a very high quality preview. Now, do you want to embed fonts? This is a big deal. The ability to embed a font in an EPS file is great because then they don't need to have the same fonts as you. Uh, in general, I would send a subset. Some people will say, no, go ahead and send the complete font in the EPS. It makes your EPS is much larger, but maybe it would get around some problems. I just use subset most of the time if I need to. And then, what data format do you need? I will usually use binary. ASCII is for very old, old systems. Every now and again you'll find a system that won't support ASCII EPS files, but in general binary works just as well and it's like half the size, so I'll go for binary most of the time. If your document is bleeding off the edge, then you definitely need to set your bleed here. For example, I could set this to two picas on all four sides just in case it was going to bleed. Actually, in this document there is no bleed, so I didn't uh, even need to bother. Now, in the advanced panel, we have even more information here. OPI, I'm not going to mess with because it's an advanced topic and uh, very few people are using OPI servers anymore. We generally want to send all the data in our uh, EPSs, uh, not proxy. I usually just leave this set to all, but this is a big one. This is a really big one to me, the transparency flattener. EPSs are PostScript, and therefore they always have to be flattened. There's no way around it. I talked a little bit about flattening in the earlier movie about PDF. You have to flatten your EPS files, and I do not like medium resolution. I want high resolution. It's not really an image resolution issue, it's a quality issue. High resolution means highest quality transparency flattening, and that's what you want to use before you send an EPS to anybody. I'm going to cover the Ink Manager. That is an advanced topic, and we'll be discussing that in a later title. And finally, when you're ready for your EPS, click Export, and you're done. As I said, it's becoming more and more rare to need an EPS file, but when you need it, it's great that InDesign can do it for you. Now it's time to shift gears away from exporting documents and on to the grand finale, printing. So, you think your document is ready to print, but is it really? A couple of decades ago, my friend and colleague Chuck Wager coined a term that stuck in this industry's lingo when he talked about pre-flighting a document to ensure if it was prepared properly. Now, pre-flighting your documents is a great idea, and so you'll be very pleased to see, hiding up here under the file menu, a feature called pre-flight. When I select it, it goes through my whole document, it traverses all of the different pages and the colors and the fonts and so on, and it gives me a summary dialog box. But, well, I wouldn't tell you not to use a feature in InDesign. I mean, after all, this is not going to jump out and bite you. But some features are worth taking with a grain of salt, as they say. The problem with the pre-flight feature is that it's a nice first step, but it's not nearly as helpful as it seems like it would be. Let me show you what I mean. The pre-flight dialog box is broken down into a summary, plus some other panels. 
If I click on the fonts panel, it gives me a list of all the fonts that are used in my document, which is pretty cool. And it also shows me that this font, Bickham Script, is embedded. Embedded means that this font must be inside of a PDF file that I had placed in my document. If any fonts were missing, it would tell me here. Or if any fonts were protected and wouldn't be able to be embedded into a, a future PDF, it would also tell me that. So that's kind of handy. But personally, from a pre-flight feature, I wish I could go in and get more information about these fonts. And you know, where is it used exactly, all the places it's used, is it used in styles and so on. It just doesn't give me a lot of information. The Lips and Images panel gives me information about all the images. And you can see this icon here, that means there's an alert. The alert means there might be a problem here. And the problem that it found is that there's one image that's in the RGB color space. Well. I can understand the need to give me an alert, but I may have wanted it to be an RGB. So, personally, I wish, maybe in a future version of InDesign, I wish there were a way to control the pre-flight to say, you know what, I know that I can use RGB images just fine. I'll go ahead and, and you know, don't warn me if there's an RGB image. There's no way to control what it will find and won't find. It's all hard-coded into this dialog box. That said, it is kind of interesting to go through and look at all the images that are listed in here, as well as are they CMYK or RGB, what page do they show up on, and what's their status? Are they linked, are they modified, missing, and so on. I can even select each one of these, and it gives me information about the file, the same kind of thing that I would get in the links panel, like what's the actual PPI, the pixels per inch of this image, and what's the effective pixel per inch. In this case, it must have been scaled down because the effective PPI is, is greater. Again, I wish that I could customize pre-flight a little bit more. Maybe in the future, I would be able to say something like, give me a warning if I have any images that are only 72 dpi, because I know that's going to get pixelated and look really bad. You don't have that kind of control here, but, you know, still, it's better than nothing. In colors and inks, I get a list of all the inks that are going to be printed out in this document, and I can see, oh, look at that, somebody had specified a Pantone color in here, and if I didn't want that, if I wanted it only to be process color, that would alert me to the fact that it was there, but this does not actually help me change that at all. See, one way that you can change that uh, later on in this chapter. In the print settings panel, it gives me a list of all of the settings of my print dialog box the last time that I went to the print dialog box. And I don't know, maybe this is useful for somebody, but I have never found this kind of information useful. I just completely ignore this. The last panel is external plugins, and this will tell me if I used any third-party plugins or if whoever created this document used any third-party plugins. And I see one sitting here, it says in booklet. That tells me that this document was probably created with CS2 originally, because in booklet was an old CS2 thing. It may not have any effect at all on the actual document, but the fact that it remembers it is, you know, sometimes useful. Now the one last thing I want to show you, this could be very useful for some people, is report. If I click on report, it'll ask me where do I want to save my report. I'll just save it out to the desktop. It saves a text file. Why don't I go look at that? I'll double click on it and it opens it up in a text editor, in this case text edit on the Mac or notepad on Windows typically. And you can see that it gives me all the same kind of information that was in that summary. So for example, it lists off all the fonts that I used, all the images that I used, and so on. So this could be useful when you're working on documents if you need to keep track of what's in a document. In an earlier chapter, I discussed how InDesign documents don't embed all your past images. Rather, it just looks to the original files on disk. That means if you're going to send your documents to somebody else to print, well, you need to send them your linked files too. In fact, you should probably send them the fonts that you use too, just in case they don't have the same fonts as you. Fortunately, you don't have to go and find and copy all those files manually. Instead, just go to the file menu and choose package. If you're familiar with Quark Express, then you know this as a different name. This is basically the same thing as collect for output. Now when you do a package, the first thing InDesign does is it automatically pre-flights your document. We talked about pre-flighting in the previous movie. If it finds anything that might be alarming, it gives me a choice to look at those by clicking view info, which will open the pre-flight dialog box. In this case, I'm simply going to click continue. The next dialog box lets me fill in instructions to my printer. This is sort of like creating a readme file, because when I save my package, it will save a text file in the same folder with any information that I put here. 
this could be helpful if, for example, you're sending a folder to a printer and they lose track of, of who owns this file. Well, they could look in the readme file and it would give you all of this information. Well, they could look in the readme file and it would give them all this information, if you fill that out. In this case, I'm not going to fill that out. I'm just going to click continue. Now, when InDesign packages up all these files, it's going to put them all in a folder. And so InDesign lets me choose what the name of the folder is going to be and where I want to put it. I'll just put it out here on my desktop. It also gives me controls of what should go in that folder. For example, the first option is, should I copy the fonts? And that's up to you. If you want to copy the fonts that you use, go ahead and turn that on. Except the CJK files. CJK is Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So it will not uh, copy those really big, huge, uh, double-byte fonts. It just ignores those. The next option is copy linked graphics. Now, typically, this is why you'd be using the package feature. So, yes, you want to copy your linked graphics to go into that folder as well. You also have the option to update graphic links and package. And you have to understand that when you uh, package your InDesign document and all the supporting files, it doesn't move your current InDesign document into that folder. It copies it into that folder. So the update graphic links and package feature actually lets you relink all of your supporting images to the new copy of your file. I personally can't think of any reason you'd want to turn that checkbox off. I leave it turned on pretty much for everything. Your document hyphenation exceptions only is a more advanced topic if you've created your, your own hyphenation exceptions, uh, including fonts and links from hidden and non-printing layers. That's pretty straightforward. If you have hidden and non-printing layers, you probably want to turn that on. And finally, there's view report. And the view report here is different than view report from pre-flighting. This report has to do with the instructions. You know, all of these things that you may have filled out here. If you have that turned on, it will simply open that up in a text editor, like text edit or a notepad on Windows, automatically for you, so you could do some editing with it. I usually leave that turned off as well. Now I'll go ahead and click Save, and we'll get Package. Note that if you are collecting your fonts, InDesign warns you that some font licenses do not allow you to send your fonts to other people. So it's just warning you. If you're using Adobe fonts, it's not a big deal because the Adobe font licenses do let you send your fonts to a service provider. They don't let you give your fonts to other people, but if somebody's going to be using your document to print, then you can send them your fonts. But for other font vendors, you just want to make sure that it's still legal. I'll click OK and it goes through and packages up all those supporting files. It saved it out to the desktop, so I'll just switch out there, look inside my package folder, and we can see there's the InDesign file, a copy of the InDesign file I was working on, the instructions, there's all my fonts, there's all my graphic links, and we're done. Now, I often use package for another purpose, too. It's a really good way to save an archive of all the files that are necessary on a job and get all the graphics, which I might have imported from all over my hard drive or even off of the server, to get all of those images in one folder. But if you do that, just be aware of one thing. Package does not grab any images that are hiding off on the pasteboard. It only takes images that are on your actual document pages. Other than that, it's a great help.